I am pleased to introduce our first speaker for today, and that is Dr. Rodney Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of integrative immunology and behavior, and he is the head of the University of Illinois Department of Animal Sciences. And he was actually a recipient of the ILSI North America Future Leader Award some time ago. So Dr. Johnson will kick off the series with an overview of the information we'll hear over the five webinars this month. So Dr. Johnson, we'll turn the platform over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep, looks clear. Okay, great. Well, first, let me just thank everybody for um, taking time to join us today, and I hope you'll mark your calendar and, and join us each Friday for the next several weeks, and you're going to hear from a number of faculty at the University of Illinois that participate in the Division of Nutritional Sciences and, and uh, the work that they're doing, and you're going to hear from a number of our students, and which I think is a, a tremendous opportunity to for the students to kind of um, get out there and, and participate um, in this type of format and talk about their research to, regardless of the stage that they're at in their in their graduate programs. But I wanna first uh, give a shout out to uh, Dr. Elvira De Mejia. Uh, Dr. De Mejia is the current director of the Division of Nutritional Sciences and, and organized uh, this webinar series that is brought to you in collaboration with LC North America and the American Society for Nutrition. Okay, I'm just going to provide a very brief overview, and, and that's, you know, I was asked to kind of introduce this uh, webinar series, and I'm, and I'm happy to do that. Um, obviously, everybody recognized today that uh, there's bidirectional communication that occurs between uh, the gut and the brain, and this has really been one of the most interesting and, and dynamic fields of investigation that I've seen, you know, having been on faculty here for almost 30 years, just the way this field evolved so rapidly. Uh, and I was a bit of an outsider because uh, I'm not a microbiologist. And, and in a moment, I'll show you, I kind of actively resisted um, getting into this field, but it was so compelling. Um, and, and it attracted me and others to, to, to get involved to, to some level. Uh, shown in the graph is, uh, the number of papers that are revealed with a simple PubMed search uh, using gut-brain access as key words. And you can see that in 2019, the last year of complete, where we have complete data, there was, you know, almost 475 papers published that uh, were connected to the gut-brain access. And if you go back one decade to 2009, only 16 papers uh, were revealed. And so just tremendous uh, exponential growth and interest in this area. And I think you know, the driving factors are shown here, um, you know, in my opinion, you know, the emergence of next generation sequencing technology to characterize uh, the gut microbiome. You know, studies, you know, showing behavioral phenotype can be transferred via gut microbiota. And this was really just stunning to me. You know, you'll remember the studies where uh, taking microbiota from an obese animal and putting it in a skinny animal and, and creating that phenotype. Really amazing results. Um, you know, probably wondering what the mechanisms were at that point in time, but nonetheless, it really was attractive and, and created a lot of interest. And then, of course, there's studies showing the correlation between the gut microbiota and neuropsychiatric disease, and then just the, the, the sheer recognition of the potential to manipulate the gut microbiota uh, in order to improve health. So we know that it's a, it, the microbiota is highly pliable, and I think you're going to see that through the course of of this webinar series, including today, uh, where Dr. Woods will talk about how the uh, exercise can affect uh, this uh, communication system. So here's one of the reasons I suppose I was actively av avoiding, you know, the, the microbiome field. I was busy, you know, doing my own work that I had been working on for many, many years, and we were interested in, in how the peripheral immune system uh, talks to the brain to induce the behavior that's illustrated in that oil painting entitled The Sick Girl. And you can see the, the classic uh, behavioral signs of, of an infection that all of us have experienced um, at some time or another when we develop some type of infection. So if you start at the bottom, you know, this is just putting it into the classic inflammatory pathway where you have inducers. So bacteria, viruses have certain molecular patterns 
that will be recognized by sensory cells. And we're talking about the immune system. And the easiest one to appreciate, of course, is the macrophage with the expression of toll-like receptor 4. When that uh, receptor is activated, those sensory cells are going to produce inflammatory mediators, things like pro-inflammatory cytokines, prostaglandins, histamine. And then these inflammatory molecules can access the brain either through a humoral pathway where they enter circulation, um, they can be actively transported across the blood-brain barrier, or they can go to brain areas that are devoid and intact blood-brain barrier and actually passively diffuse into the brain parenchyma and interact with uh, different cells of the brain. The neural pathway involves the vagus nerve, and, and we now know that uh, the vagus nerve expresses receptors for certain pro-inflammatory cytokines, and there's a neural signal then that can connect the peripheral immune system to the brain. Now, what's important from our perspective anyway is that whether it's a humoral pathway or a neural pathway, they both have in common the stimulation of microglial cells, which are the macrophage-like cell that resides in the brain. And notice that they, they're a significant proportion of the cells in the brain, so accounting for about 15%. And it's these cells that when they become activated, start producing pro-inflammatory cytokines that elicits the sickness behavior. So in my lab, we were interested in microglial cell activation and its role in inducing sickness behavior. We also have a lot of interest in microglial cell activation and how it can affect brain development. We study this both in, in fetal brain and in the early postnatal brain. And then how aging and microglial cell activation uh, is, is manipulated or how aging affects microglial cell activation. And what I'm simply showing in this uh, graph on the right is if we isolate microglial cells from an old mouse compared to a young adult mouse, what we see is a phenotypic shift in the microglial cells so that they are more pro-inflammatory. So old but otherwise healthy animals have kind of a low-grade inflammatory reaction in the brain uh, that we think contributes to things like cognitive aging, maybe a predisposing factor to neurodegenerative diseases, things of that nature. Incidentally, we've recently shown that this can be somewhat corrected through the use of dietary fiber. So this is where I started to become interested in you know, the, the microbiome because all of a sudden this fantastic work that was occurring in, a, in an area somewhat different than my own um, kind of swerved into what we were doing. And this was an important paper for our lab because it uh, demonstrated that the host microbiota can actually control uh, the maturation and function of the microglial cell. Again, we didn't know much about the, the mechanism of how this is occurring, but clearly uh, you can see down in that lower box some of the, the um, findings that came from this paper you know, where germ-free mice had uh, immature microglia. Their microglia tended to be ramified and inactivated, and that's what's shown in the reconstructed microglia there on the right. You can see the ramified morphology of, of when it's uh, in the germ-free mice. Uh, there was a reduced or increased density of microglial cells, but they didn't work right either. So they had a dampened innate immune response. And all of this could be corrected by reconstituting the gut microbiota. So clearly indicating that the gut microbiota have the ability to affect this very important immune cell that resides uh, in the brain. And so you can imagine uh, then the interest in understanding the pathways that can uh, control this communication. So, you know, here, you know, the question is, how does the gut microbiota, you know, talk to the brain? How do we go from, you know, understanding that these changes in, in, in the population of microbes in the gut are actually causing fundamental changes in behavior? So, of course, we have some appreciation for this now and that the gut microbiota produce bioactive short-chain fatty acids like acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Um, these short-chain fatty acids can be absorbed and, and therefore enter circulation. However, they're, they're rel fairly short-lived, uh, detected at relatively low concentrations, and there's really not a lot of evidence to suggest that at physiological uh, relevant levels that they actually enter the brain, and moreover, uh, the receptors for the short-chain fatty acids not uh, expressed uh, in the brain. Um, 
but they have this other mechanism um, where they can bind uh, G protein coupled receptors like FFAR2 or 3. And importantly, cells of the immune system express these receptors and the vagus afferent nerves do as well. So now if we think back to my last slide where I was talking about the immune system communicating with the brain where it involved both humoral and neural pathways, we have the same possibility uh, in this gut-brain axis where in the humoral pathway, it's probably not you know, the short chain fatty acids directly accessing the brain, but rather inducing hormonal changes in the periphery, uh, regulating immune function, and that those molecules then have the potential to change uh, the way uh, the brain is functioning. And then we have the neural pathway, this viscerosensory signaling pathway. And this is important because the vagal afferent nerves project to the nucleus tract solitaire, shown here as the NTS. And in this area, neurons project to the limbic system, and including areas such as the amygdala, which is in, involved in regulation of emotional behavior. So the things like anxiety and fear, pain, and social behavior, all of which now have been shown to be affected by uh, the gut microbiota. So the pathways of communication are starting to uh, be illuminated, which creates even better opportunities for manipulating this pathway to improve uh, health. So this is a, you know, it's a complicated story, right? Because we're talking about the brain and, and neural and humoral pathways and, and changes in the gut microbiota. And so you can imagine it, it, it takes a, a team, if you will, to kind of uh, train and, and prepare future leaders, you know, to, to address the complex issues like this. And so when we at, at Illinois um, set out to develop a training program, um, what we did is identified faculty who had an interest in the gut uh, brain axis or working at different levels of, of this uh, uh, issue, and we divided them into areas of expertise. So we have uh, 12 perceptors, 12 faculty shown there on the far right, uh, divided into three areas of expertise, depending on you know what they were doing. Some in, focused on the brain, others on the gastrointestinal system and others on the gut microbiome. Uh, with this training grant that was funded uh, through USDA, uh, this National Needs Graduate Fellowship grant that's titled here, Nutrition and the Gut-Brain Axis, Implications for Development of Healthy Aging. Uh, we're supporting um, eight fellows. Three are funded through the, the grant itself and, and five others are being funded through uh, different units here on our campus. So it's really a tremendous uh, opportunity to bring lots of people together with a common interest. All of the students in this program uh, have a, a co-advising model where they have to have at least two faculty mentors representing two of the three different expertise areas. So really building in guarantees for interdisciplinary training. Uh, they, we've developed coursework to support the program, uh, areas that, that relate to professional development, and importantly, they re require a ex experiential learning event outside of the university. So finally, uh, just to kind of show you where we're going the next several weeks, um, next week, um, Dr. Kelly Swanson and his student Celeste Alexander uh, will uh, talk about sex-related differences in host metabolism and health. Um, the following week, uh, Yanina Pepino and Clara Salme will talk about um, their work on low-calorie sweeteners, um, treat or trick. Uh, the following week, Aditi Das and Andrew Steelman will talk about um, their work relating to a neuromodulatory role of omega-3 fatty acid endocannabinoids uh, found in the gut. And then uh, September 25th, uh, Dr. Sharon Donovan and Naiman Khan uh, we'll talk about their Strong Kids 2 program, specifically the role of childhood nutrition and obesity in the microbiome brain axis. And today, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Jeff Woods and uh, uh, his student Noah Hutchinson on the effects of exercise, diet, and the gut-brain axis. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I'm going to turn it back over to Maria to introduce um, Dr. Woods.
So moving on to Dr. Jeff Woods. Dr. Woods is a professor of kinesiology and community health with additional appointments in the Division of Nutritional Sciences and the new Carl Illinois College of Medicine at the University of Illinois. So Dr. Woods will be sharing information about his work on the influence of exercise and diet on the gut-brain axis. And just a reminder to go ahead and type your questions at any time. Um, so Dr. Woods, we'll turn the platform over to you. All right, thank you so much, Marie. Uh, I definitely want to thank everybody for attending here on this uh, uh, Friday afternoon. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Division of Nutritional Sciences, as well as uh, ILSI, uh, for the opportunity to share our presentation with you today, and especially for, for our students, uh, in particular today, Noah Hutchinson, my student in um, Nutritional Sciences, who uh, um, really appreciates the opportunity to present, especially during this pandemic when we, uh, we don't have too many opportunities to get out there in front of people. Um, so for students listening in, uh, shameless plug here, uh, we're always looking for bright, motivated students to come to Illinois and, and learn and work with us. If you're interested, uh, please make sure that you uh, check out our website shown here on the slide um, and uh, email any of the, uh, the faculty in the Division of Nutritional Sciences and express your interest. In, uh, uh, we've got a great group and we'd love to have you. So uh, today, uh, really, I'm going to talk about uh, exercise, um, uh, some about diet, but certainly exercise. I'm a kinesiologist by training. I am not a microbiologist like Rod, and I can't, came into this field about 10 years ago um, uh, with interests uh, because of my interest in um, uh, inflammation and the immune system. Um, and really, uh, you can see on this slide uh, many different paths of communication between the gut, uh, including its microbiota and the brain. Some we know about, as shown here. Uh, many we don't. Uh, anybody who's ever had a stomach ache knows that the gut can talk to us. Um, but I think it's really important to uh, remember that this dialogue is two-way. So it's not just the microbes and their products or, or the immune system and the gut talking to the brain. It's also the brain talking back to the immune system uh, and also to the gut. And so there's this bi-directional communication that goes back and forth, uh, regulatory feedback that leads to uh, alterations in, in health of the gut, the brain, and, and the whole body for that matter. Uh, for example, gut metabolites can cross the barrier or be recognized by receptors on the barrier to generate signals in the host. Uh, butyrate can bind to uh, free fatty acid receptors two and three to induce GLP, uh, which acts on the brain to induce satiety. So that's just an example. In the opposite direction, hormones produced by the host can affect the gut microbiota and gut health. Uh, noradrenaline released by adrenergic nerves can interact with certain gram-negative bacteria in your gut and cause them to grow or be more virulent. Uh, indeed, chronic stress, which increases norepinephrine, can cause dysbiosis and, and uh, uh, gut disease. So I think we all know that uh, diet certainly has a big effect on our, our gut microbiota and its function. Uh, what you may not realize is that exercise does as well, and so that's where I'm going to focus today. Um, Diet and exercise affect who's there, in other words, which microbes are in the community, uh, and what they do, what products they produce, and how they interact with the host and each other. Uh, and we know the diet and exercise influences brain structure and function. So could it be that some of the effects of diet and exercise are mediated through the gut microbiota and its uh, metabolome? So we do know that exercise affects the brain. I've been involved in some research here at Illinois uh, for a long time with a guy named Mark Kramer. Uh, he's moved on, but we published some uh, articles back about 10 years ago now, uh, linking exercise training to changes in brain structure and function. You can see the titles here. Uh, exercise training increases the size of the hippocampus and improve, improves memory. Uh, some of these effects are mediated through BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, in, in, in people, we can measure that in the blood and correlate it to changes. Uh, of course, those are correlational, and we would need to do more mechanistic studies to, to, to rule that in as the uh, mechanistic pathway. So really today, what I want to do, uh, for those of you not um, uh, uh, familiar with the gut microbiota, I'll give you a quick uh, catch up uh, on that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a study where we address the question, does exercise independently affect the gut microbiome? And independently, I mean independently from diet. Um, I'll share with you uh, results from uh, really, the first human longitudinal trial on exercise in the gut microbiome. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to focus on a study where 
when we address the question, does exercise-induced changes in the gut microbiome affect host health? And uh, this is a study we did in collaboration with Mayo Clinic where we uh, did the first exercise biota transplant into germ-free mice. So we had uh, mice that were sedentary, mice that had exercised, and then we transplanted biotas from those animals into germ-free mice that did not exercise, and then uh, hoped that some of the effects of exercise would show up in these animals uh, just by transplanting the biota. And then lastly, Noah is gonna talk about some of our current work and our future directions. So uh, I'll talk about stuff we've done, and Noah is gonna talk about stuff we're doing and, and are aspirationally thinking about. Um, so uh, we've got a gut barrier. Uh, gut barrier uh, consists of epithelial cells, colonocytes, shown here in blue, uh, that act as a barrier between the outside world, which is the lumen of the gut, and the inside world, which is us. Uh, in the lumen, there are uh, there's fecal material, there's, uh, there's luminal bacteria. We've also got a barrier of mucus, this mucus layer uh, that exists kind of uh, right above the, uh, the epithelial barrier. Uh, and that's very protective in terms of uh, allowing protection uh, of the barrier. But it's also um, important because there's uh, uh, mucosal associated bacteria that sit on uh, the mucus and, and use it for food and also uh, interact uh, through, through the barrier there. Um, there are other cells in this barrier, uh, including goblet cells, which secrete mucus, panis cells, which secrete, uh, secrete antimicrobial peptides, enteroendocrine cells that secrete hormones, uh, M cells or microfold cells that actually sample the outside world and mucosa, mucosal environment and lumen uh, to educate our immune systems against uh, our microbiota, to, to train it uh, so that we, we uh, don't react against e everything in the microbiota. Um, we, uh, the, the barrier is characterized by tight junction proteins that exist between the cells. Uh, so this is a very tight barrier. Uh, things do get across, uh, either actively transported, of course, uh, or, or leak through uh, via diffusion. Um, the barrier can be broken uh, in, in cases of, for instance, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and when that happens, uh, some of the outside world, some of these um, uh, bacterial uh, bacteria and the products can enter into the lamina propria, the area just below the barrier. And right below this barrier, you can see there's a lot of immune cells, which you obviously predict uh, uh, to be there because this is kind of at the interface between the inside and outside world. Uh, cells like macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells that, uh, if the barrier is broken, uh, can have a profound inflammatory response that can cause uh, uh, further uh, barrier breakdown, but also systemic effects, uh, including sickness behavior and changes in the brain. So the gut microbiota, or our flora, consists of uh, bacteria, archaea, fungi, and bacteriophages. Uh, these bugs can be commensal, mutualistic, or opportunistic. Uh, there is a very competitive environment in our gut. Uh, there are niches of bacteria in very different spaces uh, along the longitude of our gut, but also along the cross-section of our gut and the mucus layer, for example, and within the lumen. And they fight each other. for They compete for resources, so it's very important. Um, to kind of recognize that we have this ecosystem living in us that uh, is in constant flux and, and, and competing uh, in, in and of itself. Um, so they're competing for resources uh, within that environment. Um, each person's biota is unique. Uh, for example, in the human colon, there's about 500 different species of bacteria. Um, the, I will say that uh, a person's biota, while unique, is relatively stable in adult life. Um, in terms of the relative abundance of different bacteria and, and types of, and species present. Um, these things can change, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you may have heard the term microbiome. Uh, so microbiome, it differs from microbiota in that it really is the genetic uh, makeup of the biota. So looking at the biota through its uh, genes, uh, we call that the gut microbiome as opposed to the gut microbiota. Uh, also remember we have a skin, oral, and vaginal biotas too. So today we're really just focused on the gut biota and the gut brain axis. So what do gut microbes do? Uh, within the gut, they compete for resources and survive, like I mentioned. Uh, they produce metabolites, enzymes, and hormones. Uh, we've already talked about uh, short chain fatty acids as being one metabolite, important metabolite. I'll, I'll hit on this later. Uh, they, they detoxify some toxins and they affect the gut barrier. Uh, either good or bad, depending on um, the tax that we're talking about. Um, they communicate to our body. And so we do know that uh, gut bacteria uh, can, and their products can promote maturation and development of our immune system. 
They can promote or inhibit inflammation. They can certainly regulate metabolism and energy harvest. Uh, they have a direct link to the liver through the hepatic portal circulation, and they communicate through the gut-brain axis. So more and more, we're beginning to realize the importance of the gut microbiota in uh, overall human health. Um, so an example of this, and I think Rod mentioned this, is uh, a study that was done um, in science, uh, by Verdura and colleagues in science in 2013, where they actually took um, uh, uh, feces from twins, uh, either an obese twin or a lean twin, and they uh, did a fecal microbial transplant uh, into germ-free mice. And lo and behold, uh, the animals that received the, the fecal microbiota from the obese twin had a change in fat mass over the course of 15 days, such that there was a significant difference between those that received the obese uh, fecal microbial transplant and those that received the lean microbial transplant. So that's really uh, powerful evidence, the power of poop, uh, that changes in the gut microbiota can lead to phenotypic changes in the host. And you know, this was one of the first studies to show that, that you know, surprised everybody, but then there's been many studies since, including some uh, with respect to the brain and behavior. Um, currently, the only, uh, only FDA-approved use for fecal microbial transplant is, a, is for a disease called Clostridium difficile, where it shows a greater than 90% cure rate. Um, so for other applications like the treatment of obesity or Parkinson's or other things, uh, uh, in, investigational new drug status uh, is, is needed uh, to be able to do that because there are some risks associated with taking someone else's feces and uh, inoculating it into you. Um, to understand the gut microbiota, uh, we need to answer a few questions. We need to know who's there, and so we can use next generation sequencing uh, in order to do that. We need to know what they're producing, so we can fall on metabolomics or targeted uh, metabolomics to be able to address that question. And then, of course, we need to know about the mechanisms of communication. So this could be diffusion, either way, again, remember, bidirectional, uh, receptor mediated, uh, examples we gave were of uh, free fatty acid receptors. It could be neurally mediated or it could be epigenetic. So we need to understand a, a lot of these things in order to truly say that, um, you know, a certain aspect of the gut-brain axis is operating and, and controlling human health. So I think we're all pretty much uh, aware now that the gut microbiome is uh, pl uh, pliable. Uh, many things can affect it. Uh, bacterial exposures at birth and early life, uh, your genetics plays a role. Uh, antibiotics certainly can disrupt your uh, normal flora. Uh, the environment that you live in, whether you live with pets, where you live, uh, your hygiene, uh, gender makes a difference, age. Uh, usually it takes about one or two years to firmly, firmly establish your unique microbiota. Uh, it's fairly stable throughout life. It's kind of like your unique signature which from a, from a uh, research standpoint is important because it's really hard to compare across individuals. Uh, it's hard to compare me to you uh, because we have different biotas. And so it's very important to do uh, repeated measure studies uh, to be able to compare you know, what happens to a microbiota when you change lifestyle, for instance, whether you, when you exercise or when you, when you change your diet um, because it's different uh, between people. And so with that, I think, um, you know, we all know that diet, including uh, changes in dietary fiber and macronutrients can have a big impact on your microbiota and its uh, products. Um, but what about exercise? I think that's kind of one of the unique things about my lab uh, in the last five or eight years that we've contributed to the literature. Um, we've uh, clearly shown that exercise can influence the microbiota, and I will show you that data. So some of the questions that we've been addressing really surround the role of uh, exercise. Uh, is exercise medicine for your gut-brain axis? Um, so the questions in green, I think uh, I'll address today. And um, uh, you know, I'll show you some data that exercise does affect the uh, gut microbiome and metabolome. Uh, and it also does so independent of diet. Uh, questions we're working on, and I have some data in the colon today, uh, colon health. Uh, it, are exercise-induced changes in the gut microbiome and metabolome responsible for the beneficial effects of exercise on the brain and other tissues? Uh, and then the ones down at the bottom in red are, are, are studies we want to do in the future. Uh, for instance, can exercise synergize with diet to uh, beneficially impact the gut microbiota? And uh, if so, what uh, types of exercise are most important? Are they different? Uh, and does it do so also for those with microbial dysbiosis? So, uh, Noah is going to talk uh, briefly about a study that we're just starting 
looking at the effects of exercise in IBD patients. So what do we know about exercise in the gut? Well, if you look here at incidence rate relative to dose of physical activity increasing uh, from left to right, you can see that uh, gallbladder disease, colon cancer, constipation are all reduced by uh, le uh, increasing levels of physical activity. Um, there is a point of no return, however, for gastrointestinal symptoms. If uh, some people cross over a certain level of, of physical exertion, uh, highly intense, prolonged exercise, for example, in the heat, they can actually realize uh, gut symptoms. Uh, and that may be due to uh, some changes in the gut barrier uh, um, uh, as well as uh, other changes. Um, but regular moderate physical activity tends to help the gut in terms of certainly reduction from colon cancer, for example. One thing you don't see on this list is inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's disease and colitis. Uh, and this, this study was, uh, this review was published back in 2001. Um, and really not much has changed in the last 20 years, unfortunately. Uh, that's why we wanna do that study with exercise and IBD. Um, but there is reason to believe, at least based on some of our data in healthy folks, that uh, exercise could be beneficial uh, to people with inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, so we got into this field. I think Rod told a little bit about why, why his lab got interested in that. And, and this is the paper that got our, our lab interested in it. So I had a student, Mark Cook, uh, back in about 2010 or 11, uh, try to answer the question whether exercise is beneficial for experimental colitis in mice. So this is a model of uh, dextran sulfate sodium, DSS. We give that in the drinking water and the animals get uh, colitis uh, that mimics human colitis, although it's still a mouse model. Um, and he found, and you can read the title of this uh, paper, he found interestingly, uh, paradoxically, that forced treadmill exercise exacerbated inflammation and, and caused mortality in this model, while voluntary wheel running actually was protective. So there was a, a weird dichotomy in terms of exercise. And it's weird because you know, many people use forced treadmill exercise training in animals, rodents, mice, rats, to improve the health of many tissues. But in this model, we found that it actually was uh, not beneficial. Um, but if you give access, give animals access to a voluntary running wheel, uh, it actually is protective in this mouse model. And so that led us to, to, the, uh, to, to study the microbiome because we do know that the microbiome and microbiota is, is very, uh, uh, is related to um, uh, uh, colitis and, and, and Crohn's. And so uh, this was kind of our rationale for getting into this field. So what do we know about um, how exercise affects the gut microbiome in animals? And you can see the titles of, of many different studies. This was a couple years old now, um, and, and a couple done by us. And so as a direct result of that um, uh, colitis study, we, uh, my student Jacob Allen, um, who is now a professor here at, at the University of Illinois, assistant professor, uh, did show that voluntary enforced exercise uh, differentially altered the gut microbiomes. In the, in the same strain of animals where we saw the uh, differential effects on colitis. Um, we also did some studies with a, a colleague at Mayo Clinic uh, examining the effects of diet and exercise and found that it or, orthogonally affected the gut microbiome and was associated with uh, differences in uh, anxiety and cognition within the gut-brain axis. So understanding the overall community structure is important in studies of this type but it's really the products of those communities and their interactions with the host that will be important in explaining gut microbiota effects on the host. So one of the first studies to, to kind of look at this was done back in uh, 2008. And what they found was that in uh, mice that were uh, given uh, running wheels, they showed that uh, it altered the mic microbiota composition, but it also increased butyrate concentrations in their cecums. And you can kind of see that here, about a twofold increase in butyrate uh, in the wheel runners versus the sedentary controls. And they also looked at, um, using kind of old technology, they looked at uh, the microbiome and they showed that uh, uh, there was a couple butyrate producing strains that were elevated in the wheel runners when compared to the sedentary controls, SM7 slash 11 and T2-87. So this is really the first evidence then that exercise might have an independent effect on uh, short chain fatty acid production um, at least in, in, in uh, rodents. So why are short-chain fatty acids important? Well, uh, first of all, short-chain fatty acids include acetate, propionate, and butyrate, two, three, and four carbon uh, molecules. Uh, they're primarily uh, produced 
uh, as a result of the digestion and fermentation of dietary fiber by uh, uh, certain gut microbes. And these short chain fatty acids then can communicate through the host uh, through free fatty acid receptor two, three. They also act through uh, histone deacylase inhibition to cause many different host effects. For instance, uh, we harvest about 10% of our energy in the colon in the form of short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids also can affect gluconeogenesis and lipogenesis. They can increase insulin sensitivity. They are food for our colonocytes, so they maintain a healthy barrier, butyrate being especially important in this regard. Um, they can regulate satiety peptides like GLP-1. They can regulate our immune system. They can stimulate mucus secretion. Uh, and as Rod pointed out, they can also alter uh, your brain in terms of uh, impacting microglia and memory. Um, a couple enzymes uh, that are important for the biosynthesis uh, of short chain fatty acids include uh, B uh, coat, uh, butyryl CoA enzyme A acetate CoA transferase, so B coat for short, and methylmalonyl CoA decarboxylase, or MMDA for short. So in the data that I'll show you, in addition to the gut microbiome analysis that we did using 60 and sRNA, we also measured the concentrations of short chain fatty acids and the expression of these two biosynthetic enzymes uh, to determine whether exercise influences uh, the capacity for our microbiome to produce short chain fatty acids. So what about exercise in the human gut microbiome? So here are some, uh, some titles of some of the studies uh, that have been done uh, before we did our study. And you can see that uh, uh, some of these studies, for instance, uh, differences in gut microbiota between uh, women with an active lifestyle and sedentary women, uh, and some between you know, sedentary people and competitive cyclists. But I think you know, all of these studies are cross-sectional, um, and that's a problem because we're comparing against different people, and we know that people who exercise regularly are very different than those who don't, and certainly they eat differently. And so that could be you know, one of the causes for these, these uh, community differences in the microbiota. Um, so there really at this time, uh, before our study, was a need for a repeated measures longitudinal exercise trial where we carefully controlled diet and we, we asked the question, could we independently affect the gut microbiota? And so I uh, had two great students at that time, uh, shown here, uh, Lucy Mailing on the left and Jacob Allen on the right. So these uh, two students spent about uh, two years of their lives uh, doing a study called Fit Gut, uh, formulating exercise intervention trials for the gut. And the primary aim of this study was to understand whether endurance-based exercise training for six weeks could initiate a shift in gut microbial communities and some of the metabolites in previously sedentary lean and obese adults. So we had both lean and obese adults in this study. So here's just quickly some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, you can see uh, lean under uh, BMI under 25, uh, obese uh, BMI above 25. They were all sedentary at the start, free of gastrointestinal disease, not having taken antibiotics or, or medications that messed with the gut or the gut microbiome. Um, we did careful dietary control, as I'll outline in the uh, the next slide. So in this study, we had about uh, we had uh, 18 lean and 14 obese. Uh, with nine female in the lean and 11 female in the obese. They're all sedentary. Um, we did some pre-testing, uh, as you do before any intervention. Uh, we had an ex exercise period where they exercised three days a week at about 60 to 75% of heart rate reserve, so fairly moderate exercise uh, for six weeks. And importantly, we wanted to make sure that whatever changes we saw with exercise disappeared when, when these uh, people reverted to a sedentary lifestyle. So we asked them, to after the six week period, then stop exercising for six weeks. And we sampled fecal samples before, uh, uh, before the exercise, after the exercise, and then after the um, uh, six weeks wash up period. Uh, we did uh, dietary analysis, uh, careful dietary control for uh, 72 hours before each fecal sample. Uh, we collected blood, we did body composition analysis, we did fitness testing, we did that before the exercise, uh, and after the six weeks of exercise, and then again after the wash-up period. So we controlled for diet by having them eat basically the exact same thing for three days before each fecal sample. Um, and in that way, uh, we did as best we could, uh, maybe opposed to putting them in a metabolic ward and feeding them ourselves, uh, uh, control for diet so that we could say that any changes that we see really are due to the exercise and not differences in acute or chronic dietary intake. 
Uh, interestingly, in the washout period of our 32 subjects, seven people wanted to continue to exercise. So who are we to say they had to stop exercise? We would like them to, but uh, so seven of the 32 were non-compliant, uh, which is, 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 is good, I guess, but also uh, reduced our power for that last part. So uh, what do we measure and how do we do it? Well, we looked at um, metabolites, including our short-chain fatty acids. We looked at the functional genes. So we isolated the bacterial DNA and then searched for a B-coat and an MMDA. And then we did 16R, uh, 16S RNA sequencing. Uh, we calculated delta values, both delta between pre and post exercise, and then also after the exercise uh, and the washout period uh, to be able to uh, do things like uh, principal components analysis factor reduction um, and then uh, comparing, you know, changes in the uh, microbiome and uh, the metabolome with uh, the phenotypic changes that we saw in response to the exercise, like changes in body composition, changes in fitness, uh, things like that, to see if there was any relationship between changes in the microbiome and changes in fitness that we could then explore in a more mechanistic fashion later on. So here's just uh, some baseline characteristics of our subjects. Uh, you can see body fat is different, uh, bone density was different, fitness was different. Um, uh, so, so here's some of the data. So we did show, uh, so what you'll see here is uh, E6 means post-exercise, uh, uh, W6 means after the six weeks of washout, uh, lean is in the hatched and obese is in the thick, uh, black bar. And you can see that the six weeks of, of exercise intervention significantly reduced percentage of body fat, about 1% in both uh, groups. Uh, increased lean mass in both groups. And you can see importantly that after the reversion to sedentary behavior, these, these adaptations were lost. Um, fitness changes as measured by uh, uh, maximal oxygen uptake were significantly elevated after the six weeks. Uh, we did not measure that after the washout. Um, so I guess the conclusion from, from these data are that the intervention did as intended. Um, Importantly, these body compositional changes in fat and lean mass occurred in the absence of differences in overall body weight. We did not want this to be a weight loss study, and we sold it as such to our uh, subjects. This really was an exercise study. So in order to uh, assess uh, the microbiome, we need to use uh, visual representation uh, of, of the community structure. And one way to do that is through uh, principal components analysis. And, and using a PCOA plot. And so uh, it's not simple, uh, but the bottom line is that each dot uh, in this graph re represents an individual's bacterial community. Dots that are closer together are more similar. Dots that are uh, uh, farther apart are more different. And so here you can see the pre-exercise baseline data. So our lean are shown in uh, red, our obese are shown in blue. And what I think you can clearly appreciate is that uh, these people are different to start with. So there's a significant difference between the uh, microbiomes of lean versus obese people. Um, this is not a surprise. This had been shown before. Uh, I think we all appreciate that obesity is associated with uh, an altered microbiota. Um, but the interesting thing was, after exercise, uh, looking at the same PCOA plot, we noticed that this, this difference no longer existed. In other words, there was a shift in uh, microbial communities induced by exercise in both lean and obese, so that they looked a little more similar. Um, when we looked at the washout period uh, in terms of, of uh, their microbiomes, again, there was no significant difference. And when we plot that as, uh, 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 we reduce the, the factors as an exercise factor or washout factor and run an independent T-test, we can clearly see that uh, in the top panel uh, between the pre and the post exercise period, there was clear orthogonal shifts in the microbiota between the lean group and the obese group. And then in the post exercise period between uh, right after the exercise and then after the six weeks of washout, there was cle clear orthogonal shifts uh, between the lean and obese group. So the conclusion here is that the lean uh, differ from the obese at baseline that exercise led to uh, different types of shifts in the microbial community structures in lean versus obese, and that these changes uh, occurred in the washout uh, too, uh, but they, sh they were or orthogonal as well, so different. So what bacteria changed in response to the exercise in the lean and obese? So in this slide, you'll see that um, uh, some of those bacteria, those in green are the ones that increased, those in red are the ones that decreased. So uh, you can see here 
Uh, for example, uh, interestingly, uh, some of these bacteria like Clostridiales and Lacnospira are known butyrate producers, Rosbiria too, known butyrate producers. Uh, so that was fairly interesting. You'll also notice that you know the, the ones that changed in the lean group were, were different than the ones that changed in the obese group. And that's probably because they have differences to begin with, would be my guess. Um, we also wanted to correlate uh, change, the changes that occurred during exercise with the changes that occurred post-exercise. So what we, uh, the reason why we did this is, is if, if, for instance, say one bacteria increased during exercise, uh, what we would expect is that after they went to a sedentary behavior, that, that same bacteria would decrease, and that's represented by a negative correlation. So if we, if we correlated the different scores, we should see negative correlations, and that's indeed what we see here. You can see significant negative correlations for many of these bacteria uh, taxa, um, indicating that whatever went up with exercise went down in the, in the sedentary period afterwards, or conversely, if it went down during exercise, it went back up. Um, in the sedentary period after. So again, clear indications, strong data that indicate that exercise is having an independent effect. And when you, when you stop exercising, that effect is lost. And so, you know, the bad news is, is that it doesn't hang around for uh, a long period of time. It's gone at six weeks. We haven't done the studies to show actually how long it lasts. Is it one week, two weeks, four weeks? Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, I guess I'll skip that part. Um, so, so the, the bottom line is that we see that exercise, six weeks of aerobic exercise at a very moderate level uh, does change the community structure. And when you stop exercising for six weeks, uh, that is reverted. We also looked at short-chain fatty acids in these fecal samples. And uh, you can see here grass for acetate, propionate, and butyrate. I think the bottom line here is that you'll see that uh, uh, the lean folks in response to the exercise training realize bigger increases of sh in short chain fatty acids than the obese folks. And that's a little bit, um, that was predicted a little bit based upon the microbiome analysis and those increases in the short chain fatty acids. I mean, excuse me, the uh, short chain uh, bacterial producers. Um, looking at the, the biosynthetic enzymes, but B-coat and MM MMDA, you can see uh, that uh, there was some uh, exercise effects here. There's an interesting, uh, uh, main effect for obesity, uh, demonstrating that at least the capacity to produce uh, butyrate is elevated in, in obese individuals, but it looks like it, it is elevated in response to exercise as well. In the insets here, you can see that when they revert uh, to sedentary behavior, a lot of these effects are lost. So for instance, propionate is, is reduced back down, uh, butyrate is reduced back down. And same thing with the uh, biosynthetic genes. So showing that something can change in one direction with exercise and then go back in the other direction with, without exercise is, is pretty powerful. So in conclusion, we showed that exercise increased and washout decreased short-chain fatty acids, more so in the lean than the obese, uh, and that exercise increased the, the short-chain fatty acid uh, uh, genes that, to generate them, uh, and that uh, obese people had higher B code. And then what we did is we uh, related uh, changes in butyrate, B-coat, and uh, the bacteria that produce butyrate with exercise-induced increases in lean body mass. So when people exercise, they gain lean mass and lose fat mass. And so we related some of these changes in, um, uh, to each other, and we found significant correlations. So for example, uh, changes in butyrate in the feces correlated to changes in lean mass to the tune of a, an R value of 0.875. Uh, same thing with B-coat, uh, same thing with uh, uh, several of the short-chain fatty acid uh, butyrate producers. Um, so what we're thinking here is that perhaps when you exercise, um, you're changing your microbiota to increased energy harvest as a defense to the increase in energy expenditure that you realize during exercise. And also maybe to help change with body composition, which also costs energy. Uh, lean mass expends more energy as well. Um, we certainly need to follow up on that, but uh, teleologically, it makes sense that uh, when you exercise and expend a lot of energy, uh, uh, a lot of energy that you'd want your microbiota to change so that you can harvest more energy from the food you eat. That'd be great for a lean person, but maybe not so great for an obese person <laughs> uh, who's trying to lose weight, uh, which is maybe one reason why um, exercise alone uh, doesn't appreciably combat, um, you know, obesity. Uh, you need diet and then exercise to maintain a proper body weight in the long run. So the take home message here is 
that six weeks of moderate endurance exercise independently affects gut microbes, changes who's there, changes what they're doing. They produce more of the short chain fatty acids and that there's some relationships between short chain fatty acids and uh, gains in lean mass. Of course, these are just relationships. So it's interesting, but they're not cause and effect. And so we certainly need experiments to understand the mechanic, mechanistic roles of exercise uh, uh, in, in terms of gut microbiome and metabolome. And so this paper got a lot of uh, uh, press uh, when it came out, really the first study to show that exercise could affect the microbiome. Um, uh, Gretchen Reynolds, a health writer for uh, the New York Times, asked a really insightful question. Um, is that one reason it's so good for us? Is, is, you know, exercise alters our microbiome. Is that one reason it's so good for us? And it's insightful, uh, really, I think. And um, uh, in other words, are exercise-induced changes in our gut microbiomes responsible for the health benefits of exercise? It's a difficult question to answer, no doubt. But I think uh, uh, the technology that we have to answer, it, it, it was inspired by a, a movie in 1976 uh, called The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. Uh, if you weren't around in 1976, maybe you're familiar with the Seinfeld episode uh, where they visited the boy in the plastic bubble. So uh, this is a, a situation where somebody's born with a defect in their immune system and they have to live in a sterile environment all their lives uh, or they'll die because uh, their immune system can't combat pathogens. Um, so the tool we have, uh, to study this in a mechanistic way are called germ-free mice. Uh, so they're reared, uh, raised in a, in a sterile environment. They've never been exposed to microbes. And so using this tool, we can introduce microbes into them to see the, the, the effects on their health and their development. And so it's a very powerful way to kind of test things mechanistically. And so in an animal study that we published in 2018, uh, we did just this. And we, we addressed the question, does a transplant of an exercise biota affect colon health? And we did this in conjunction with Mayo Clinic, because at the time, we actually didn't have a germ-free facility on our campus, but they did have one at Mayo, and we had been collaborating with them, so we, we teamed up with them. So the study design, basically, we had sedentary animals and animals that we exposed to a wheel for six weeks. Uh, after the six weeks, we harvested their uh, 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 biota. We transplanted that biota into germ-free recipients. Uh, remember, these recipients did not exercise, so basically we were trying to transplant the effects of exercise just by transplanting the biota. And really what we focused on was colon health, which makes sense. That's where the, most of the bacteria reside in your gut, and so that would be a good first place to look. And we looked at uh, colons, uh, normal colons, uh, but also colons uh, that we challenged, uh, uh, or animals that we challenged with DSS, so in the absence or presence of, of DSS. And to summarize a lot of data, which I'll, I'll show you quickly in the slides after this, or, or at least breeze through them quickly. Um, uh, amazingly, uh, the animals that received the exercise microbiota had overall healthier colons. Uh, they had reduced colon inflammation. They had a potential for improved gut barrier function. We found that histologically that uh, uh, the animals that received the exercise biota had uh, goblet cells that were full of mucus. Um, they had reduced symptoms in response to the experimental colitis. They had attenuation in body weight loss, uh, uh, bleeding, and diarrhea. And in the colons of those animals that had uh, received DSS, uh, the colitis, there was an increase in uh, signals of healing after the colitis, indicating that uh, maybe uh, the, the gut microbiota that we transplanted was helping them recover from the colitis uh, quicker than the animals that had the sedentary biota. And I know I'm running short on time and I wanna certainly make sure I give um, Noah uh, some time here. Um, but uh, this slide just shows you the differences in the gut microbiomes uh, in the donor animals here on the left. So clear differences like we've shown before between animals that exercise and animals that were sedentary. And importantly, when we transplanted these biotas into germ-free mice, there were still differences in, in the microbiomes. Uh, uh, as shown here. That's important to, to demonstrate. So uh, the transplant uh, worked. Um, we did show that uh, this transplant of the exercise biota reduced gut inflammation. So one thing that happens when you introduce microbes into an animal that's never seen them, <laughs> as you might imagine, there's a profound in, uh, uh, immune response to the microbes, uh, profound inflammatory response. And so this is like, uh, you know, several weeks after the transplant, you can still see inflammation in some of these uh, um, guts of the animals that uh, had received the transplants, um, but the inflammation was uh, lower in the animals that received the uh, 
uh, transplants from uh, an exercised animal. Uh, histologically, as I mentioned, uh, some gut mucus uh, depletion was uh, was lower in the uh, exercised animals. Uh, inflammatory cell infiltrate in the colons uh, was lower in the exercised animals. Um, I won't show this slide, um, but uh, in the DSS model, we showed that colon length, which is a proxy for inflammation in the colon, uh, was lower in the exercised animals. Uh, um, body weight change was was not as dramatic in the in the animals that received the exercise biota, uh, as well as some other data there. Um, and I'll skip this as well. So we concluded that exercise changed the gut microbiota, and that led to altered uh, composition, short chain fatty acid profiles, and body weights in the recipient animals. I did show some of that. Uh, the sh uh, short chain fatty acid profiles were strongly correlated with body weight and reduced gut inflammation in these animals. And exercise induced changes in the gut microbiota attenuates DSS colitis outcomes and speeds regeneration while promoting antimicrobial defense. We actually measured some antimicrobial peptide differences. So kind of to summarize, um, we're very much focused on uh, the role of gut microbes play in the gut uh, brain axis and whether or not uh, gut microbes contribute to the beneficial effects of exercise. We know exercise affects all tissues, skeletal muscle, adipose, liver, the immune system. We've shown you some data today on the gut um, and also the brain. Uh, the brain is important. I haven't shown you a lot of data on that, but that's kind of where we're going, and Noah's going to speak to that in a minute. Um, so I want to say that, you know, you are what you eat, certainly, but you also are what you do. And so it's important uh, to look at all types of lifestyle behaviors, diet, exercise, um, and it does appear that both of those uh, can impact your gut microbes uh, and, and lead to changes in your health. So with that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Students who've been in my lab, Jacob, Lucy, Yi, uh, Noah, who's currently there, uh, the, the army of undergraduates that help us, uh, the, the, the tech folks and support folks at our campus, uh, people at Mayo Clinic who helped us with uh, the exercise uh, germ-free studies, as well as my colleagues at, at the U of I, uh, many of them in the Division of Nutritional Sciences, Rod Johnson, Rex Gaskin, Sharon Donovan, whom you'll hear from uh, later in this seminar series, as well as others. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Um, I suppose we have time for maybe one question or two, um, but we certainly can take questions after the um, after Noah's section. So I'll leave it up to Marie. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Woods. I think in the interest of time, we'll go directly to Noah. So I just wanted to introduce our final speaker, Noah Hutchinson. He is a second year USDA fellow in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. And currently Noah works, as you saw, in the lab of Dr. Jeff Woods. And his work investigates how diet and exercise modulate the gut microbiota and ultimately link to host health. So we will turn the control over to you, Noah. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, I would also like to thank everybody for coming out today. And I wanna thank Ilse for putting on this event and DNS for allowing me to have the opportunity to give this talk today. So as Dr. Woods said, I'm gonna be giving kind of an expansion on what we have going on at the moment and then talking about some future directions where we may take it. So firstly, what we have going on here is a logical extension to the Fit Gut study. Uh, where we are performing an exercise intervention for ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and IBS patients. This is a collaborative project with Carl Hospital, and thanks to COVID, we are currently still in the recruitment phase for it. Um, that's been a little bit of an obstacle to jump over. What we're looking for are adults who have a confirmed diagnosis of, of an inflammatory bowel disease um, that are currently sedentary, not pregnant, and obviously haven't taken antibiotics within the last couple months. So before our testing period, we're going to run some screening on them. Um, obviously, we need to get their medical history and do some baseline measurements of fitness, like VO2 max and a DEXA for body composition. We're going to review their diet history and then work with the dietitian to create a three-day menu that will allow us to control microbiome um, to the degree that we would like to. We'll also be taking baseline blood and fecal samples to assess certain biomarkers of interest. So um, with this study, uh, you see it's a crossover design. So that way we can determine if the, the micro, I mean, if the adaptations will revert after um, cessation of the exercise period. 
So we're going to be doing repeated measures of fecal samples, certain questionnaires, blood samples, electrolytes, mannitol, um, gut permeability tests, and we'll be closely monitoring their diets to make sure that everything is consistent. The exercise protocol is graded in that it increases in time and intensity as it goes on. Um, this will help us kind of, you know, increase lean body mass, but not decrease overall body mass, kind of like you saw in the fit gut study. That's kind of the goal of this type of protocol. So the question now is, how does this relate to the brain, right? This seminar series is about the brain. Um, it's been quite well documented for quite some time now that patients with inflammatory bowel disease exhibit increased rates of many psychiatric disorders. Specifically, depression is very prevalent among them. Uh, they generally exhibit high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which act on the gut-brain axis and microglial cells. Um, they induce the, uh, the rate-limiting enzyme of the kynurenine pathway IDO1 and create potential neurotoxic kynurenine catabolites, which potentially also reduce systemic tryptophan availability for serotonin bio biosynthesis, which may exacerbate sickness behavior. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later. But back to the microglia, the inflammation certainly does have an effect on pro-inflammatory activity in microglia. So, uh, we know that kind of, I'm expanding on uh, the study that Dr. Johnson brought up. Um, we're working with them. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the PI of this grant. Um, we know that aged microglia are pro-inflammatory and very hyposensitive. We also know that aging increases intestinal inflammation and visceral sensory, sensory signaling to the brain. We also know that gut microbial production of short chain fatty acids downregulates this pro-inflammatory microglial activity. So in this grant, we're using fiber feeding strategies um, to modulate the infl intestinal inflammation and ideally microglial inflammation. And we're gonna be measuring local ileal and intestinal inflammation as well, and markers of neuro and neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration using histology, fluidine RT-PCR, metabolomics, and other advanced techniques. An interesting, another interesting aspect of the study is uh, the group is working on developing a transgenic free fatty acid receptor 2 knockout model. Um, this will allow the group to test its mechanistic properties in this observed phenomenon. Understanding these mechanisms will be very helpful in developing dietary interventions to combat neurodegenerative states, activities, and conditions in the future. The first aim is to determine do intestinal short chain fatty acids normalize communications in this visceral sensory pathway and inhibit um, age-induced pro-inflammatory microglia? And secondly, does this happen through free fatty acid receptor 2 on intestinal epithelial cells? So oh, moving on, uh, we know, based on what you uh, heard just now from Dr. Woods, we know that microbial composition can be altered by consistent exercise training. And we know that fecal microbial transplants can improve gut physiology and reduce symptoms in response to colitis when compared to microbiomes from sedentary animals. Um, and there's some human uh, versions of this in the works right now. So now the question is, that we thought was very interesting would be to, to investigate would be, do gut microbes contribute to host adaptations to exercise? The University of Illinois recently installed a rodent notobiotic facility. You can see a couple of the um, stuff, a couple of the machines here. Um, so we thought this would be a good way to capitalize on this installment. So the first experiment um, to measure this, this question, to, I mean, to test this question is um, using a notobiotic model. So the first aim is do germ-free mice display the same voluntary real, wheel running patterns as conventional mice? And the second aim is if they do end up running the same amounts, do germ-free mice adapt to exercise similarly or equivalently when compared to conventional mice? So to test this, we're using a two by two model here that will help us tease out um, the differences. I mean, tease out when certain effects are related to exercise or certain effects that are related to the notobiotic mice. Um, so, for eight weeks, um, some of them will be exposed to either sedentary conditions where they'll just have a locked wheel in their cage, or some of them will have an, a, a wheel in their cage that they will run on, um, as mice just do instinctively. And we have a telemetered system that allows us to monitor when and how much they run. Uh, we'll be monitoring their body weight and food intake, 
Um, on the seventh week of the intervention, we will be measuring their glucose tolerance via an IP injection test, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And at the end, we're gonna go doing some uh, physical fitness measures like grip strength and uh, treadmill endurance. And then upon dissection, we will use body, uh, I mean, uh, tissue collection for uh, muscle enzymes, uh, colons for gene expression, brains, and many other tissues. We'll also be measuring their body compositions at the end. Germ-free research has uh, quite a bit, quite a few limitations to it. Um, as you can see in the background here, that's one of the isolators. Uh, there's not a lot of space in there, and your manipulative uh, capabilities are sincerely, uh, severely hindered. Germ-free mice also experience altered development, so it's not a completely accurate um, depiction of what will actually happen. Not only is it an animal model, but it's also an abnormal animal model. These are more expensive mice to work with. Uh, that's pretty obvious, and it's more time consuming. Um, there's a lot of stipulations with entering the germ-free facility and getting equipment into the germ-free facility, which doesn't allow you nearly as high level of manipulation either. Um, if you look at this hood, I'm just bringing this back to kind of show you that this is really all the space you have to work with. So manipulations have to fit within there. And so I don't think our treadmill is going to fit in there. So repeated measures are difficult. However, that does not obviously invalidate results. So. Um, this is just a kind of a evaluation of what might happen um, in AIM-1. So it's possible that the mice run less, um, and this would explain obviously the lack of adaptations in the second AIM, but will be interesting to follow up on, um, you know, potentially introducing a microbe to these mice could make them run more. That would be an interesting phenomenon to investigate. And if they run more, well, that's, you know, that's going to be a whole slew of other uh, interpretations and will be interesting to follow up on. The probiotic approach is not something unique to us. Um, there have been other studies that have used this approach attempting to um, enhance performance with um, probiotics. However, they're still in early stages and efficacy is still somewhat unclear. So the second model of, of doing this is antibiotic induced dysbiosis where you administer broad spectrum antibiotics to the mice regularly. So the aims are very similar to this in this experiment. Um, the first aim would be does regular consumption of broad spectrum antibiotics affect the natural wheel running, wheel running behavior? And the second aim would be does this consumption of antibiotics affect the adaptations that they will experience to regular exercise? Study design is very similar. Um, this is the study design we just used for a recent cohort. Um, it's important to note that we added the antibiotics three weeks in because that allows us to determine whether or not the, the mice, their running wheel patterns are affected by the antibiotic administration. There's a decent amount of variability within the data as a whole. So it's important to get a general pattern before you add antibiotics to see if the antibiotics had any sort of effect. So we're going to be collecting fecal samples, um, taking, you know, fitness measures, doing a glucose tolerance test, and testing their uh, treadmill endurance at the end as well. We'll also be collecting all sorts of other measures for tissue, biochemistry, and omics approaches. So uh, the, the feces will be used for 16S sequencing for the microbiomes as well as a metabolomic analysis uh, for short chain fatty acids and potentially other microbial metabolites. Body composition will be done before, after, and after the lead in and at the end of the study. However, uh, this is not currently available. So what I'm gonna talk about today, we actually had to use perigonatal fat pads as a replacement, but that is also a marker of fitness and voluntary wheel running adaptations. And like I had previously stated, we'll be doing muscle enzymes and gene expression, as well as protein expression, um, histology and colonic gene expression, glucose tolerance testing, brain gene expression, um, heart weights are generally, um, heart weight adaptations are generally observed in exercise models, um, as well as serum analysis. This is the general uh, procedure to conduct a glucose tolerance test in mice. Uh, after a 12-hour fast, you administer an IP injection based on their weight with a glucose solution, and then measure their uh, glucose slightly before the injection, and then four times 30 minutes, each 30 minutes apart after that. And you can kind of measure the time under the curve 
and the disappearance rates of the glucose. What's interesting about this test with concerns to the antibiotic treatment is that there have actually been models in the past that have tested this um, in an antibiotic depleted model, and they've seen um, and they've seen increases in glucose tolerance without exercise. Generally, exercise interventions for glucose tolerance are done on mice in a high fat or some other obesogenic conditions. But um, interestingly, the antibiotics actually uh, increase glucose tolerance in these mice. Um, and the, you know, the authors of the paper theorized that potentially that in the absence of short chain fatty acids, as Dr. Woods mentioned, short chain fatty acids are used as fuel for colonocytes. But in their absence, colonocytes may shift towards glucose utilization instead. So for AIM-1 um, being the effects on voluntary wheel running, our hypothesis was no. Um, the reason we hypothesize this is because there's a recently uncovered relationship between ghrelin levels and wheel running activity. So ghrelin levels were actually shown to spike right about when the dark cycle kicks on for mice, which is actually when they start to become the most active. Um, Ghrelin, and they also developed a ghrelin knockout model, and ghrelin knockout mice actually ran less and overall and during the dark period than wild type. And single administration of a ghrelin receptor agonist in the ghrelin knockout mice at the beginning of the dark cycle actually markedly enhanced their running. Another interesting time uh, note here is that time-restricted feeding actually increased wheel running in both groups. And ghrelin knockout mice showed attenuated postprandial enhancement of dopamine. Potentially, there's a relationship here between the reward circuit, but more research needs to be done to prove this. Now, why is that interesting? So, the, and it, well, that connects to this actually broad spectrum antibiotics model I just referenced previously with the insulin. Uh, they actually did not, they actually measured ghrelin levels and did not see a difference in ghrelin production in these mice. This leads us to believe there will not be a difference in ours. So, to test this, we have this is a picture of the telemetered running wheel in the cage. Um, it sends signals to that hub that's in my hand right there, and the computer will actually, it'll show up in a computer program, and then we can export it for analysis. Here's some preliminary data from this first cohort we actually did. Um, we obviously, so here we see that we didn't really see an effect based on antibiotics. So that's a pretty easy interpretation there. Um, you, you'll see it's pretty variable in general. That's just kind of the nature of the data we did not see an antibiotic effect. The next aim, testing whether or not the adaptations will be differently. We hypothesized that they will have different adaptations. And then this is a picture of our treadmill for our endurance testing. So in our first cohort of mice, we did notice a decrease in body weight due to voluntary wheel running. So there is some, some sort of adaptation happening there. Interestingly, we did also notice a decrease in perigonadal fat pad weight. So it's not just a reduction in body weight, it's also a reduction in fat pad weight. This is an, indicates that their uh, body composition might be trending favorably as well. So here is our treadmill data. Um, this is our test to fatigue. We have the, the y-axis is the amount of distance run. Uh, we did a graded protocol. Um, you'll see here that there's quite a big training effect in the voluntary wheel running mice. Their endurance capacity is quite a bit higher. We did not see an antibiotic effect in this measure. However, it's important to note that we only administered the antibiotics for three weeks rather than the whole six or seven week um, trial period. Perhaps a longer administration of antibiotics during the wheel running would allow uh, would potentially show larger effects, especially because these mice had three weeks to run and adapt before they were given antibiotics. We also, potentially a larger cohort would yield um, more significant results. So our early interpretations of these results are that physical fitness tests show that we had a successful running wheel intervention, that putting them on the wheels is doing something to their physical fitness. Up next, we have to do microbial sequencing, metabolomics, and muscle omics to reveal a more in-depth look at what's actually going on um, underneath the skin. And future cohorts will include longer antibiotic treatment periods now that we know it doesn't affect voluntary wheel running. And obviously, we're going to try to get a, a larger N in the future. So 
the question related to all this is what about the brain? Um, where do we go from here? Obviously, this is the gut brain axis we're here to talk about. Um, and there are some interesting directions we can go with this. But it's pretty well documented, and Dr. Woods touched on this already, that exercise has been proven to slow progression of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it promotes neuroplasticity and neurogenesis via brain-derived neurotrophin factor. It's also been shown to improve aspects of cognition and to pre treat uh, neuro neurological diseases like depression and anxiety. Now, this is particular, particularly interesting because as I said previously, these are very commonly observed in patients with inflammatory bowel diseases. However, the mechanisms um, that are proposed, most of them lack a whole lot of support and evidence. Um, so th this is an interesting route of investigation that needs to be explored more. So at the forefront of this, there are some gut microbial metabolites that have some interesting effects. I had mentioned this previously. So there are associations that have been drawn between the composition of the gut microbiota and symptoms of depression. IBD, uh, IBD patients, which I previously said, are frequently depressed, display increased IDO1 activation and decreased levels of fecal uh, tryptophan de derived aerohydrocarbon receptor ligands. And aerohydrocarbon receptor ligands have shown efficacy in ameliorating depressive symptoms in some models. Um, this is a relatively new area of research. So there's not a whole lot of research on it, uh, models on it yet, but hopefully there will be more coming soon. Um, this is a model from Dr. Wood's presentation. Um, the exercised biota transplants did decrease inflammation and downregulated down IDO1 uh, pretty significantly. So uh, a proposed mechanism I have for you here is that so it's it's been well documented in exercise that exercise upregulates muscular expression of PGC1 alpha, the mitochondrial uh, biogenesis gene, and this mitochondrial biogenesis gene actually upregulates kynurenine amidotransferases. Um, so IDO1 is the rate limiting enzyme in the kynurenine pathway of tryptophan catabolism. Kynurenine is a precursor for multiple potential neurotoxic compounds such as quinolinic acid among others. So decreasing the amounts of these kynurenine uh, compounds in the blood uh, may potentially promote brain health and uh, ameliorate depressive symptoms. Uh, exercise may potentially um, pr promote microbial production of AHR ligands, as well as decreasing inflammation, as we've seen previously, which will also downregulate IDO1, as it, that is um, induced by pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, in the serum, you have, so due to this re reduced uh, IDO1 activity in the serum, you would hope to see increased uh, availability of tryptophan. Um, a tryptophan is important because it serves as a biogenic precursor for the neurotransmitter serotonin, which we frequent, which we know um, is associated with good affect and positive mood. So with the exercise, we would hopefully see a decrease in serum kynurenine. Um, with the upregulation of this kynurenine aminotransferase, that can convert kynurenine to kynurenic acid, uh, you would hopefully see an increase in kynurenic acid, which actually exerts neuroprotective um, effects. So with this up, uh, increase in serum tryptophan and decrease in kynurenine and increase in kynurenic acid, you would hopefully see in the brain increased levels of serotonin and melatonin, which is also um, a downstream of uh, tryptophan and uh, uh, decreased levels of these neurotoxic compounds that I've said before. Now, what would happen if we did antibiotics treatment or if we did a germ-free model here? So you obviously don't have the microbial production of these aryl hydrocarbon receptor ligands. So uh, what would happen to inflammation is hard to tell. Um, IDO1 activation obviously would be influenced by that removal. I would say that the muscular uh, adaptations would some it still somewhat exist. However, the magnitudes I'm unsure of. Uh, and well, I would hypot I'm, these, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here. And the tryptophan and kynurenine ratios may be affected by the presence of the gut microbes. And the outcomes would potentially be different, but this remains to be seen. Um, it is an interesting area of investigation um, moving forward. So the question is, where does nutrition come in? Um, 
So there's obviously the potential for a consumption of microbiota enriched prebiotic fibers to synergize with exercise. It'll be important to tease out whether these effects are additive or synergistic with some two by two designs. Um, as we've seen that exercise enriches the microbiota and we've seen that dietary fiber enriches the microbiota. Would these effects stack on top of each other or would they magnify each other and intensify these results? Um, there's also some similar studies in probiotics that could serve as similar functions to diet and exercise. And fecal microbiota transplant models for depression are still relatively early, but would also be interesting to look at. And with that, I am done and we'll leave it up to the floor for any questions. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Noah. And we do have a few minutes for questions. So uh, I'm gonna start with kind of a, a big picture question. Um, and Noah, you just talked about the intersection of diet and exercise. So just thinking more broadly, do we know, what do we know at this point about the contribution of diet versus exercise? Um, could you choose one? Um, do we know the degree to which this might be additive or synergistic? You want to take that one, Noah, or you want me to give it a stab? Uh, I think that I think you would be better suited to answer that question. Yeah, so, so that's a great question, and you know, with that, this is aspirational where we, where we want to test this. So I think the existing data on the effects of diet on the microbiome versus the effects of exercise suggests that the effects of diet can be much stronger than the effects of exercise. I think that 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 can be said, uh, at least on a community structure level. Um, to this point in time, however, there's very little study of the combined effects of diet and exercise, so we don't know um, if there's any additive or synergistic effects. Uh, I believe there's going to be uh, because uh, I think that the diet and, the, and exercise affect the microbiota differently. Um, if you think about diet, um, you're thinking about uh, substrates that come in to the lumen of the gut that interact with, with um with bacteria and niches of bacteria within the gut. I think with exercise, and again, this is the studies that we've done have controlled for diet. Um, you know, there's probably some, um, either something leaking out of the body into the lumen, perhaps lactate, uh, or um, there's some neural mechanism that's activated with exercise that communicates through the, uh, um, the enteric nervous system or through the immune system uh, to alter the, the biota. And so, you know, it's my belief, I guess, I don't have data to back this up, that because exercise and diet likely interact with the biota through different mechanisms, that there could be additive or synergistic effects when applied together. Uh, there just hasn't been real good studies that have done, you know, aerobic exercise with and without fiber um, and, 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 you know, or other dietary uh, interventions to, to, to look at that. So good question. Um, yeah, uh, you know, my my hope and guess is that uh, there's going to be additive and synergistic effects, and it'll, you know, doing both is better than doing one. I think certainly for human health, we know that. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Woods. Um, so talking about the physical activity side, um, a question about how you decide either for animal or human studies on the physical activity intervention. So do you choose that based on existing evidence that this specific, you know, three days a week or this specific heart rate has an effect? Um, or how do you choose that? What do we know about that physical activity um, that might have a positive effect at this time? So sure, these, these are questions we get all the time. So it's really a very practical question and an important question. I mean, what do I need to do in order to affect my health or my, my gut microbiome? And so the studies that we have done, our strategy pretty much, you know, with people, has been to focus on um, ex exercise that is uh, moderate in intensity, uh, that 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 uh, starts at low levels and increases, especially if we're talking, we're taking sedentary subjects or people into our, our exercise studies. Uh, you know, so so the in the fit gut study, for example, um, you know, this was a, a very moderate exercise that built up over the course of six weeks because they were sedentary. Uh, it was cardiovascularly based exercise, so it was aerobic exercise. 
Uh, I think I, maybe we needed to point that out a little better in our presentation. So that, you know, we're, we're talking about aerobic exercise here. We're not talking about resistance exercise or strength training. There's very few studies that have looked at strength training uh, and the microbiota. And I don't know if we can come to any conclusions yet, but I bet you there's going to be some effects. But certainly there are, and we've shown it with uh, endurance-based training. So, you know, going out three times a week and doing, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes is, is what we have shown to affect uh, the gut microbes. Uh, you know, would would longer be more, you know, better or, you know, uh, we don't know yet. There is some evidence that uh, high-intensity interval training or HIT training also can affect the, the microbiome. Oh, okay, that's interesting because that is a little bit of a combination of both cardio and strength. Um, okay, so another question about the exercise-induced changes. How much do you think is related to changes in GI transit time versus, you know, we know that exercise affects host metabolism? Yeah, so another great question there. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that regular exercise and physical activity can speed up fecal transit time. So the, the time it takes for, um, you know, uh, food materials to move through the gut. Um, but that's not universal. There's also some studies that haven't shown that. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe is the, is the answer. Maybe there's a, a speeding transit time. Uh, some believe that faster fecal transit times are, are, are responsible for lower uh, colon cancer risk in um, people who exercise regularly, which makes sense. I mean, if uh, your feces are in contact with your, your uh, colon wall for long periods of time, some of those carcinogens can hang around and cause transformation of cells. Um, and that's certainly been touted as a potential mechanism, but I, I don't think it's that simple. Um, I think there's many things that are going on when we exercise, uh, and in particular in our gut, that can help protect us from colon cancer and maybe from IBD, although we need to do those studies. Okay, super, thank you. Um, with attention to time, maybe we'll just take one more question. Um, well, this is a kind of a follow-up, but what do you think about the changes in the microbiota being due to alterations in the blood supply, which happen during exercise? Yeah, sure. Another, another good question, and you know, everybody's thinking along the same lines as, as we are. What, what does the exercise do to the gut that we know of that could explain some of these changes in the microbiome? Uh, so when you exercise, there's a shunting of blood away from the gut to the muscles and skin. Uh, and so there can be, in some instances, hypoxia of the gut. Uh, usually it's not severe and not a problem in, um, in moderate types of exercises, but it can be a problem if the exercise is intense, prolonged, and especially if the exercise in the, is in the heat, uh, because that puts a greater strain on your cardiovascular system where you shunt even more blood to your skin and away from your gut. And so you can get frank hypoxia in the gut. And, and some people do present clinical symptoms, say, after a marathon where they'll have a um, you know, symptoms of diarrhea and, and problems in the gut because of this hypoxia. So it's like a transient colitis, I guess, um, um, uh, due to hypoxia. Um, uh, in terms of that being responsible for changes in the gut microbiota, I, I don't know. I mean, most bacteria in the colon are obligate anaerobes, so a lack of oxygen should not affect them too much. In fact, it may help them. Um, there is an emerging literature that higher levels of oxygen in the lumens of our colon uh, perhaps due to gut barrier disruption, may actually lead to an outbreak of facultative anaerobes, uh, bacteria that can um, switch their metabolism from anaerobic to aerobic. And, and many of those uh, uh, switches or many of those facultative anaerobes are associated with uh, taxa that are opportunistic pathogens. Um, so that, that could be a, a bad thing um, if, it, if it went on too long. But, you know, as for the mechanism, uh, you know, it's a good idea, but it, very difficult to test in terms of uh, ruling that as, the, as one of the sole factors whereby exercise affects the gut microbiota. Thank you. Okay. Fascinating stuff. Um, I think we're just about out of time. So we wanted to thank everyone who's stuck with us. Thanks to the University of Illinois and um, ASN as well. And um, I just wanted to, yeah, thank Dr. Johnson, Dr. Wood and Noah and no, we look forward to seeing the outcomes of your work. And I just wanted to point out that we do have a webinar 
for the next four weeks, so please visit our website to register. The next one in our series is shown here, and that will be with Dr. Kelly Swanson and Celeste Alexander, and it's at the same time next Thursday due to the holiday weekend. So thanks everyone for joining, and we hope to see you in our next webinars. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.